Hello, welcome to the second series of Digital Twin Talks hosted on the Digital Twin Hub. I'm Tom Hughes, the delivery lead for the Digital Twin Hub, and it's my pleasure to be introducing and facilitating this series of talks. Over the series, we're going to look at the topic of the interconnection of digital twins. We've got seven excellent talks culminating with a round table on the 25th of August. Today, I'm introducing Miranda Sharp, who works for the Centre of Digital Book Britain and leads the Information Management Framework. Miranda's talk, Why a National Digital Twin, will look at some of the cross-silo challenges that a National Digital Twin may address, including carbon reduction targets, coordinated responses to disasters, and improving well-being for society. Um, Miranda will provide some tactical examples of how sharing information between digital twins can address some of these cross-silo challenges, and provide uh, some information on the consultation that's taking place on the information management framework and how you can be involved. Before I hand over to Miranda, as a facilitator, I'm really looking forward to this series of talks. You can join us at 10.30 on a Tuesday for a live discussion with presenters, myself, and wider members of the CWB team. So please bring your questions and challenges uh, to the hub so we can continue the discussion. Over to you, Miranda. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm here to talk about a national digital twin and the benefits it can create for everybody. In the DT Hub, asset and process owners are already engaged in building digital twins with, a rich, with their rich and varied supply chains. I'm glad that that's happening. And there are many reasons we're discovering why a digital representation of assets and processes make what are, derive benefits. Now I said they're assets and processes, um, because I believe that the digitization of, for example, the train is as, as, as important as the digitization of, for example, the timetable. Both of those digitizations and the use of that data can contribute to making the workforce safer. It can improve productivity, incre increase customer satisfaction and reduce costs. It's also important, we believe, that this nation of digital twins can join up and create a national digital twin, because only then can we as a society tackle the cross silo challenges of achieving carbon reduction targets, coordinated disaster response, and aspire to the world described in the recently published Flourishing Systems paper from CDUB. In this talk, I'm going to describe the ways in which benefits, the benefits of connecting digital twins can be described and realized and the barriers which we imagine stand, stand in the way we tackled. In the digital twins that are being created, we're seeing those that are being connected um, and those that are being isolated, tackling the issues of, for example, preventative maintenance, personal and organisational productivity, customer access to information, and in the example of the linked, digital, linked um, data assets, which is happening in the National Underground Asset Register, supported by the Geospatial Commission, the important case of sharing of data for the improvement of workforce safety. Now, these digital twins at the moment are relatively isolated. And that's, and that's absolutely fine. And it's important that these isolated digital twins deliver benefit back to the people who are investing in the data and the connectivity of that data, because only then will they be motivated to, invest, to make those investments and achieve those benefits. But the thing that the National Digital Twin Programme aspires to do is to link those isolated digital twins and derive even greater benefit. And I've got some slides here to illustrate what I'm talking about. If we imagine that a stakeholder or if we describe a position that a stakeholder performs an activity in order to deliver a function, we can, we can describe that that activity, the driving of that activity, had to take some effort and some cost, and that the, the turning of those cogs delivers benefit back to the stakeholder. Now, there are many organisational and complex models and, what, and, and that, that will we'll take it, will we'll feed back those, those benefits in complicated ways. But this is the simplest representation where we put effort in to turn the cogs and we get benefit back um, from the, the, the performing of that activity. 
If we then imagine how these cogs turn with the, with the addition of a digital twin, an isolated digital twin, which happens on the second slide, we can take some of that activity into the digital realm. And those, those cogs will turn in, in a better and more efficient way. So we've talked, we, others have talked about how simulating activity in the digital realm um, and planning in a different way can deliver a greater number of benefits uh, back to the stakeholder. In the example on screen, we're talking about a local authority that is has a model of a highway, for example, and by working with a digital twin, they can move a greater number of people, um, giving them access to economic mass in treasury language, uh, but they, they also, for example, deliver space for other functions. For example, natural capital uh, for the trees on the side of the road um, uh, and space underneath the road, where, for example, pipes might be running. On the third slide, we talk about how the uh, isolated stakeholders um, and isolated assets are connected through a coordinated single digital twin at the top. In this example, we hope that there are an even greater number of green arrows returning benefit to the stakeholders who are responsible for performing the activity. Uh, and that might be back to our road example. If we're choosing to resurface a road and as a highway provider, I dig up the road and time the traffic lights in such a way that minimises a disruption. Um, I, well, I might also work with a utility provider who has their assets underneath the road um, and so that we coordinate that activity and have an overall reduction um, in, in to, for example, people moving around um, on that road. So let's put that into a real world example. And here we have on the next slide, uh, we have a, a picture of a town um, which uh, which has has a road running through it. You will see that the town is more or less it is is slightly divided. There's on the, we've got blue dots uh, which represent personal addresses, uh, residential addresses, and the red dots which uh, which represent commercial addresses. Uh, we've got um, allotments and churches which are the big blocks, and you can see how that this is a picture of a community. Um, what, what, what the, this is a bit of a sad story, and the, in a flood event in 2017, um, this village, which is Tadcaster, um, the, the road, uh, which um, we, we can see when we look at the full map, was washed away. Now, this not only caused um, pain and disruption for people who could no longer access the services because they were on the wrong side of the river, uh, but also a great number of uh, other services were, were, uh, were, were concentrated onto that, that bridge. And that's not unusual. Um, it, it, it's much cheaper and more effective uh, to put your service on a bridge. So, for example, communications uh, cables, uh, power cables um, and, and water cables, for example, will, will often concentrate uh, on a bridge. However, in this case, everybody knew that their pipe was on the bridge, but nobody knew that everybody's pipe was on the bridge. And so when it was washed away, there was a great deal of inconvenience um, and, and, and a high degree of cost. Um, to, to put that bridge back in place or alternative arrangements back in place. If those people had been able to able and willing and had indeed shared their data about the location of critical assets, um, we might we might, for example, have put more investment in uh, to, to ensuring that the maintenance and safety of that bridge and would have would have been involved in less expensive rework. That's the end of the slides for the minute. But if we're going to share data like that through these digital twins and the connective tissue between them, we need new business and organisational models. Now, the ODI, the Open Data Institute, are doing some fantastic research at the moment into data institutions, which work uh, with, with people who have data, with organisations that have data, so that they can be shared in a sustainable and value driven way. Because what's clear from the sharing of this data is that we're going to have to invest um, in, in data and the mechanisms of sharing it. And in order to make that investment case effectively, we need to be confident that the value is going to flow back to those who are making the investment. And the data institutions, which the ODI describe, are a way of sharing that benefit in a, in a trusted and sustainable way. But even then, once we've, we've managed to make the business case and we've got the right business models, um, to support uh, the, the interconnection of data, we might also run up against the problem of policy and regulation. So, for example, at the moment, if, if uh, utility providers dig up a road in, in our example 
and in order to find their asset and work on their asset, they might find somebody else's asset, but at the moment there are no incentives for them to, um, to share information on the assets they've found um, and the condition they're in. And if that was to change and the data asset was to increase, um, the, and the use of that data asset was to increase, we, we, would, we, would, we would be able to build towards um, a greater business, set of business cases um, and confidence in investment in the connection of digital twins. And that is where the National Digital Twin Programme is taking effect. So people who are working in the hub have a, have a safe space to have conversations about the description of ben the benefits of isolated digital twins. As we said before, that's important because we need the benefits to flow back to those that are making the investment in those digital twins. They'll also be able to describe the barriers and then we as a programme can understand the scale of the, and the attractiveness of those different benefits and we can make the case uh, for the removal of barriers and we can share and hopefully increase the scale of, of the benefits of, iso of isolated digital twins. Meanwhile, in the common stream, we're building the information management framework which was recently, which was described in the recent document published by CWB. Now this is a consultation and I am very keen that as many people as possible contribute to the consultation, the questions in that consultation so that we can have a debate about how the information management framework, the true connective tissue that's going to bring together digital twins can be built to support as many people and organisations as we possibly can. Because coming and the, so we're working in the hub on people who have their isolated digital twin, twins who are aspiring to connect them both within their within their existing organisations and across organisations. And we're working in the commons, building the connective tissue that we hope can work for as many for everybody. As these things come together to create the national digital twin, we hope that we can realise the benefits of a high functioning infrastructure system in which productivity, carbon reduction and human flourishing can take place and society can benefit as a whole. Thank you very much.